Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. I'm looking forward to the next couple of months and getting back into the swing of things with this podcast. I want to thank you guys, the listeners, for all of the support that you've given my podcast over the years. It's hard to believe that I started this in February of 2015. Uh, it's been a great journey and I look forward to uh, getting more information to you guys. I want to thank the sponsors of this podcast. I want to thank GoHunt.com and remind you guys that the Black Friday sale actually is starting early on November 12th. There's tons of great gear that's 60% off at the Go Hunt gear shop. Go to GoHunt.com. Also, remember with this Black Friday sale, when you sign up for Insider, you're going to get $100 off to spend at the Go Hunt gear shop. That's just when you sign up for Insider. If you want the Explorer, you get $50 to spend in the Go Hunt gear shop. Go to GoHunt.com. Use the J. Scott promo code. Uh, guys, I want to thank Go Hunt for their sponsorship. I want to thank you guys for supporting Go Hunt. Uh, they've been a, a loyal supporter of mine from the beginning, so go check them out. I also want to thank Kuyu.com. Kuyu is the ultralight hunting gear that I've been wearing since 2010. Uh, great ultralight hunting gear. Uh, they've got three camo patterns from the Velo to the Verde to the Vias. Uh, they've got packs. They've got all sorts of great lightweight gear. Go to Kuyu.com to order. It's a direct-to-consumer website. You can go to Kuyu.com to order the gear there. I also want to thank Phonescope.com. Use the JScott23 promo code for a 10% discount. Phonescope is the digiscoping device that I use on my iPhone uh, to capture some of the videos and photos that you see on my Instagram account. And then I'd also like to thank Lathrop and & Sons and remind you that they're doing a mountain hunt Hunter boot giveaway and a custom synergy footbed giveaway. All you have to do to enter is go to lathropandsons.com, click on the link there to enter into the giveaway, and you can be entered into that drawing. Give James and Stephen a call if you want to discuss and talk to them about their three boots. They basically have the Encompass, the Mountain Hunter, and the Elite Boot, plus their custom Synergy footbeds. I've been wearing them uh, now for over a year and just absolutely love their boots. You, there's two ways to get hold of them. Boots at LathropAndSons.com, or you can call them directly. Call James, call Stephen directly. They're two brothers, 618 544 eight seven eight two guys let's get right to these episodes if you'd like to send me a message you can go to my instagram account which is at j scott outdoors you can send me an email j scott outdoors at gmail.com god bless and thanks for your support let's dive into some of these questions um there's a bunch of them i don't know that we'll get to all of them but um let's just dive through um some of them the answers might be uh, fairly short um, some of them might be longer than others. Uh, okay, we've got a question here uh, from a Jesse underscore Parks on Instagram. On average, how far do you normally walk in before you start laughing? So I'm going to assume, since he doesn't mention archery hunting, I'm going to assume that he's talking about coos. I'm, I'm assuming that he's talking about, you know, rifle hunting coos. Eric, what would be your answer to, on, on average, how far do you walk before you start laughing? I actually get that question a lot. Um, if it's if it's my own hunt and I'm not helping someone that um, can't hike as far, my typical hunt I'm I would say an average of of two miles for my spots. But okay, again so that depends me, on on the area. Yeah. Let me let me back up and ask you just a follow up question. So. For the listeners out there, what you're saying is, on average, the spots that you like to hunt from your vehicle that you're going to walk roughly two miles and then start flapping. So I would assume that that walk is with the headlamp and, you know, you've got your route kind of predetermined and then you're walking yeah. about two miles and then you start flapping and spend the day flapping. Yep. Yep. Okay. I'll, I, try to, I try to focus on areas that... Um, that I uh, I dread to go hike. <laughs> so <laughs> if I'm kind of like if I'm if I'm producing some excuses not to go, that's the area I kind of want to go because I know 
that kind of gets me away from the crowd. Yeah, and I would answer, you know, if, and I always tell people, if you can walk up at least a mile, if you can get a mile away from the nearest road, um, that that gives you a chance of getting into that better, you know, better age class, better quality buck. Usually, it's not a guarantee. Um, and sometimes in Arizona, it's find hard. It's hard to find a place that you can, you know walk a mile and you don't hit some other road or four wheeler trail or something. Yeah. But in general, if people. It's so easy to just get to a high spot in the road and just glass and think, you know, oh, I'm really pounding it. But that usually gets hammered. And in southern Arizona, even central Arizona, you know, the bucks by the road get shot. So if you can get in there a little bit further, so that's, that's cool to hear that you go, um, you know, 200 or two miles or so. Uh, a question from Jeremy Zelko. Can you find 100-inch plus inch coos? Um, let's see, by getting up high and looking, or do you have to, I'm sorry, this question uh, cut out here, uh, can you find 100 inch plus coups by getting up high and glassing, looking far, and I think this question is, or do you have to get close to them? Eric, what's your answer to that? Yeah. That kind of ties into something I was going to hit, hit on in that uh, previous question, too. Um, sometimes I've, I've noticed you, it's not even necessarily hiking as far to get away from people. It's hiking up to the vantage points that people don't really want to go to. And oftentimes if you hike up to that, that hard vantage point to get to, you get a completely different angle um, of glassing than most people that they're not going to have. And that could be the difference of finding a 100-inch buck or not finding a 100-inch buck. Um, I think yeah, you bring it, up a huge point there about angles, and that's something we don't talk about very much. Yeah. But would you agree that sometimes the angle is everything? In other words, like what you yeah. said, you're going to a spot that may be just hellacious to get to. It may not be necessarily two or three miles in. It may only be a half mile or a mile in, but nobody wants to go there. But if you can get there, you actually can get up and get an angle that no one else can see. And I, I think that's a huge, huge tip right there for people. Yeah, yeah. Um, especially if it's a thick area, um, angle is everything. Um, I, there's been times where I, I, I know a box in a certain area and i glassing it from one angle, I don't see anything, and you hike to another angle and then it's like the box right in the open. Um, yeah, Arizona is just, it's its like that, and the coos deer hide so well in this thick stuff, and especially you get boulders and stuff. You have to be at the right angle just to see a buck sometimes. For sure. Would you, without skewing your opinion, I have an opinion that if you can, typically the higher you can get, the better you can, the better you can see, and the more that you can look down on a deer, the better opportunity you have to find it. In other words, if I was looking for a particular deer, obviously you want to be fairly close as well. You don't want to be so far away that you can't make anything out. But um, So distance plays into it. But if you can get high and look down, just like what you said, if you change the angle, he's out in the open, whereas when you're kind of lower, there's a lot of brush, and those openings are not as big. It seems like when you get real high, you can actually, those areas open up quite a bit. Even areas that look thick, you know, when you're looking horizontally, when you're looking down, all of a sudden that changes that. Oh, yeah, for sure. I'm always a proponent of getting as high as, you're trying to find a vantage point, an area that will get you as high as you can with as many views as you can. I have noticed, though, um, I mean, the caveat to that is that if you're on a really steep point um, or ridge, like, you can't, you can glass down low and see the stuff lower, but oftentimes the hillside that you're sitting on, you cannot see below you. And I found some of the bucks actually, you know, they I've gotten screwed in the past um, when I was hunting with uh, Justin Birch and we were looking for a particular buck and we were up as high as we could go and looking down and the buck we were after was about 100 yards straight below us so that we could understand him because, yeah, because yeah. you just can't see down. So, I mean, 
if you if you have a buddy, that's the best thing because you could have you could position someone lower down looking at the ridge faces, and you could be up high looking down at all the draws and then all the cuts. Yeah, and that's mainly where that, being up high helps. I think that you bring up a good point too, and I've talked about it before on the podcast. But if you have a buddy cross glassing, in other words, yeah. You or your buddy go to the high knob peak and have the other buddy get across and basically be looking into below where you're at and cross glassing. Or if you've got a big canyon, you're on one ridge line, your buddy's on the other, and you're basically paralleling with each other, looking. Basically, you're you're sitting with your tripod facing your binoculars or looking in the direction of your buddy, but you're looking at different angles and you're cross glassing and that that is a huge um tip i think out there for people that you know if you're hunting with a buddy definitely try cross glassing um not to be confused with cross dressing uh but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that that's a great way to find buff we've got another question here from mark uh period 27 on instagram and he wants to know how big your 2017 archery buck was. Um, uh, for that matter, how big was the 2017 archery buck, and how big do you think the velvet buck was in August? Um, yeah, I got a lot of people asking me that. Um, I uh, I actually I never put a tape on him. Um, Good for you. Good for you. Yeah, yeah. I, it, I don't. Know. I I um I I I get score like. Especially with guiding, it's very, it's very important to know score and to score bucks to build up your your knowledge and your ability to estimate deer. Um, and it's nice to to communicate. Oh, hey, that buck is like a hundred and ten inch class. He's about this yeah. much, just to know what he, what he is. But as far as when I kill a buck, um, and and I have him on the ground, I I don't want to score him just for the simple fact that I don't want that, I mean, it sounds kind of, I don't know, hippie. You don't want it to skew, you, you don't want it to skew yeah. your, 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 the elation you had of shooting the buck, right? Yeah, I don't want it to re-identify him, in a right. way. Because, right. I like that. You put a, yeah, you put a number on a buck, and then he, you know, someone else shoots a buck that's a little bit higher number, then he's seen kind of less than that buck to a lot of people, and it, I just I think um, the buck is he is what he is he's 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 an old buck he's big and that's all that matters to me I don't want to I don't want to put a I number like on his head. I, you know I'm a huge proponent of field judging and you know scoring and putting tape on things and you know knowing what things score but so it seems the older I get the more it's it it doesn't really matter because the buck is you yeah. know, the buck's dead and so. If he's bigger than what you think, are you going to be more excited? If he's smaller than what you think, are you going to be less excited? And so, yeah, I love that yeah, answer. That's... I love that answer for sure. Um, a question from A Z J Cole Open Desert: What's your opinion on big coos differing their patterns from smaller deer? So, in other words, I think he's asking specifically big coos bucks compared to small coos bucks, what are some things that you've noticed in their, in their, their differing pattern? Um, I've noticed, uh, you know, the vast majority of those older bucks tend to almost be more sedentary in a way. Like, they don't move a whole lot. Either they don't move a whole lot or they move too much to where it's hard to find them. Um, it's kind of funny how they... <laughs> Big bucks, they either tighten their circle or they just go yeah. crazy and you see them all over. Um, it, yeah. It's really one or the other. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, it's either they're real tight circle or they, they travel. Yep. Yep. It's funny because there's two 5 by 3s that I'm interested in for Savannah's hunt. Um, and one of them, he has such a wide range that it's to the point where he's showing up on each end of the mountain range um, whenever I go look for him. And then the other buck is so tight that, you know, like there's this one certain canyon you could always go find him in. Um, it's yeah. kind of weird. I don't, I, I, I wonder if that's just if, 
and if that's a behavior they have because they they are like that, they've survived that long. Um, yeah, you know, I think they're all yeah. different. And, but I would say in general, I'm curious your opinion on this, in general, it seems like the older a deer gets, the more they tighten their pattern. And I would say the drifter buck or the traveler buck is a little less common than, uh, I would say more common would be that they would tighten their pattern and they don't move as much. I'm curious your thoughts yeah. on that. Yeah, I think it just comes down to them not really moving as much. They're not on the open lollygagging for you to really see them. They're, they're just harder to find in general. I just, they just don't, I mean, I've watched, some some more mature bucks, not necessarily, not necessarily like the, the biggest bucks on the mountain, but the more mature ones that have been around the mountains for a long time. They kind of just they don't they'll get up and feed in bed, and they'll get up and feed in bed, but they're not really covering a whole lot of ground, not really going across hillsides. They're kind of just laying low in a way. Yeah. Here's a question from Marcus Twelve Munoz. And I'll answer first. <laughs> um, <laughs> big deer, 34A, question mark, question mark. And my answer would be, Marcus, yes, there's big deer. There are big deer in every unit in southern Arizona. Oh, yeah. Don't ever let anybody tell you anything different. Um, 34A, obviously the Santa Rita's, you know, you've got everything from desert floor all the way up to the, the highest pines, you know, some of the highest elevation in southern Arizona. Um, so absolutely there are big deer in 34A. One thing I would say with a lot of these units in southern Arizona, 34A is one of the most popular units in southern Arizona, I think because of its proximity to Tucson. But the other thing I think is because of its vast variety of terrain and because it's one of the prettiest units um, down there, it does get a lot of pressure. So if you are looking for a big deer in 34A, my recommendation would be to be out on the desert floor where the density is very low or potentially be up high, um, you know, way high where they're hard to find in the thick stuff, and that's probably where you're going to find your biggest deer. In 34A, all of the middle stuff gets hit so hard I, I doubt there's as, as many big deer in the middle part of 34A, and I think you can take that for every unit in southern Arizona. Yep. Eric, what, what's your thought? I agree 100% with you. Um, I mean, every year big bucks come out of every unit. They're, they're there. Um, you just need to find them. And just like you said, those middle-range spots that have easy access to um, with roads and stuff, you're not really going to find that many big deer along those areas. Yeah. Uh, question from Dudley underscore AZ. Um, are most of Eric's hunting skills self-taught or learned through his father and their crew? That's a good question. Um, a lot of my recent hunting skills have been self-taught. I, uh, I grew up um, learning from my dad, from Cole, from Ron Grimes, um, and uh, some other guys that you know aren't aren't as well known because they're not on social media much, but they're they're straight up killers with a bow. And I've had yeah. the uh, I've been fortunate enough to to learn from those guys, and I've taken what I've taken kind of bits and pieces that they do that work for me, and then built a, uh, on top of that for my own kind of style. Um, I mean, everybody's different. Certain things that I do are not going to work for. For someone else, um, it's just fine and kind of the hunting skills that work best for you. And that's all through answer. trial and error. <laughs> yeah, and for those out there um, wondering, you've spooked your fair share of deer over the years, haven't you, bud? Oh, yep. yep. <laughs> <laughs> Me and you both. I mean, I've done some of the craziest, dumbest things you've ever seen in your life, and, you know, sometimes they work and sometimes they don't, and I think, like you said, trial and error, I mean, you, you learn as much as you can, but then it comes down to kind of having your own style and, and uh, figuring things out, and a lot of it comes from screwing up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not the uh, nowhere near a what you would call 
a great hunter. <laughs> I just, I, I focus on working as hard as I can and, um, and putting myself in situations where I get as many opportunities as I can. I like it. Uh, Game Chasers 3 says anything and everything about 100-inch bucks, where they like to stay, pattern, stories, etc. So that brings mm -hmm. up a good question because 100-inch, for Cooster Hunters, 100-inch is like, you know, quote-unquote the holy grail. 100-inch bucks, yeah. plus, that's what everybody's after. Um, yeah. What are some things that you would say if people, you know, maybe people listening have not harvested their first 100-inch buck, what advice would you give them as far as, you know, what are they missing? What are some ingredients you think that, you know, without knowing specific cases, to kill 100-inch bucks, what are they missing? That's a good point. Um, hmm. I think it comes down to really time in the field. Um, maybe trying to put myself in their shoes. Maybe finding someone to to have as a mentor that that um, that is successful at finding those types of bucks. Um, that kind of shortens the the learning curve down a little bit to to where you know, hey, I need to go like hike over into this bull that doesn't get that much action. Um, and then my my odds of finding a, a deer that's hundred plus um, is a lot better. Or finding just expanding your range and looking at different different deer, seeing areas that have seem to have good genetics, and then knowing, hey, maybe I'll get away from the roads here and um, start looking in there, and I might find a hundred inch. Okay, you can find like we talked about earlier, you can find a, a hundred inch buck pretty much in any unit. It's just um, it comes down to to putting in the legwork and getting behind the glass and looking at a lot of areas. They're there. Um, it's just the process of elimination of areas, really. Um, and don't you think, too, um, it comes down to time? Like, you can't yeah. You can't expect... I, I get questions on my Instagram a lot, you know, guys saying, you know, um, I drew this tag, and, you know, I really want to kill a 100-inch-plus buck, and, okay, and do you have any tips? And I said, well, um, how much have you scouted? Well, I, I, I won't get a chance to scout because my work's in. Like, I get it, totally, 100% 100 yeah. understand yeah, I did people are busy, but... 100-inch bucks are not easy. Like, you, you know, you you have to, the, that's the upper echelon of bucks. And I would say time behind the glass and the amount of scouting, you know, are you out there when they're in velvet? Are you out there, you know, after the rut or, or peak rut, you know, trying to find some of those bucks and then retrace their steps backwards, you know, finding them where they're running and they're out exposed in January running around. And then say, okay, I found a good buck or two. Now I'm going to try and figure out, are they there? Is that where they always live? Do they come there to rut? And then maybe backtracking that buck. Um, but, you know, guys that consistent, consistently, like yourself, that shoot big, big deer, they're out there all the time. And um, I'm sure you're finding with your schedule this year being a little bit more smashed up, it's it's probably going to be crazy because you're used to spending so much time out there glassing yeah. and out there kicking around. Um, but that's something that I would say is get away from the roads, you know, sleep out, sleep out on the ground, you know, use your backpack and, and get away from the roads, number one. Number two is spend a lot of time. And, and wouldn't you say that the velvet time is also a huge you know, guys that shoot big bucks consistently seem like they spend a lot of time when the deer are in velvet and really figure them out oh, for sure in velvet. For sure, for sure. And uh, I get the time constraints and stuff. It, I mean, there's times where Tristan and I have gotten up at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. To, to get out um, to either check cameras or to, to make sure we're in a spot early enough to glass first light. Um, you kind of have to work around your schedule a bit if you, if you really want to find a buck of that caliber. And I, I agree pretty much with everything you've said so far. Yeah. Uh, two specific stalking techniques that are unique to the species. That comes from N period crafts, Craftsman LLC. Two specific stalking techniques that are unique to the species. Um, 
Mm. How would you answer that? I'm not... Hmm. I'm not entirely sure if there is, there's any uh, specific, like, species-specific techniques. Um, because, you know, mule deer, you're going to stalk about the same as a coos deer, depending on the terrain you're stalking them in. Um, I found a lot of some of the higher country stalking coos deer is pretty similar to, like, high country mule deer stalking in some areas. Uh, we're using boulders and and slopes as your advantage to get in close. What, what do you think, Jay? Yeah, I mean, I, I think something that's kind of unique to coos is they tend to bed up and hold hold like quail. So I yeah. think if you're, t if you're talking about either archery or rifle, um, and that's where if you have a spotter that can either A, radio you, or B, hand signal, or, you know, have some sort of signaling system, if you can, even with a rifle, if you can bed a deer down, have someone stay on that deer or stay on the bush that the deer's on, in other words, so they don't take their eye off, which we've talked about before. Yeah, exactly. And then the, the, the hunter is able to stalk into, you know, even with a rifle, if you're able to, st sometimes stalk into 300 yards is difficult on these deer. So um, specific techniques are know that those deer are going to hold up like quail, and I've seen it so many times where people get impatient and instead of getting with a rifle, you know, 250, 300, 350 yards away and getting in a rock pile and going, okay, I'm in a sniper position. I'm now going to sit here and wait until that deer gets up. They get impatient and they go walking saying, oh, that deer is gone. And they get 10 yeah. yards from the bush where their buddy said the deer is and all of a sudden the deer jumps up. Yep. So, you know... <laughs> I, I think that is kind of specific to coos. They will let you walk a lot of times. Sometimes they'll, you know, you top over a ridge at a mile and they'll take off running. Sometimes they will let you yeah. get to 10 yards and they will hold, even big bucks will hold, 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 and all of a sudden they'll just blow out. So I think that's, you know, something specific to, to stalking uh, for sure. Um, let's go to... John period Milburn two three seven best way to hunt pressured units in Arizona. That kind of ties back to what we were just talking about um, a couple questions ago about trying to find the areas that um, that aren't pressured as much. Like thirty three is a notorious unit for getting an insane amount of pressure on these rifle hunts, um, and it seemed like over the years people knowing that they need to get out farther has kind of made the unit almost to where those areas that are harder to get to are seeming to get more pressure, too. Um, it, even in that case, you just got to try to find some of the spots that people don't really necessarily think about hunting. I think is what it comes down to when, when you have a unit that's that's got tons of pressure, even on the spots that are hard to get to. Um, and those could be, like, the spots that you notice everybody drive right past to go hunt their favorite stomping grounds. Um, I, I found, I think Dwayne Adam talks about this too, like those those highway spots that everybody's driving right past. Um, I found some of the biggest bucks I've ever found in spots like that. Um, but yeah. people don't. And it's not really a secret because, I mean, I'm guilty of it all the time too, even though I know that that those places are worth looking at. For sure. I think, too, when you start talking about pressured areas, I think you have to be disciplined as far as you have to be out there with a headlamp before light. Don't be the guy yeah. that leaves camp in the gray light and finally gets to his frosting knob and out. Like, you know, you have to be diligent. You have to walk out with a flashlight. Like, don't, oh, well. I don't see anything. Usually that last 30 minutes of glassing is when the biggest bucks or when the bucks in general st stand up and a lot of people are already hiking back to camp. So, and then midday glassing. I think even in heavily pressured oh, yeah. units, deer that, you know, know that there's a lot of pressure around, a lot of times, you know, 11, 12 o'clock when that shade changes, 
you know, they will get up and feed and move around. You know, you know how it is, Eric, when, you know, you, you, you're sitting there glassing, you see a buck, he's feeding, all of a sudden you look away for a second, you look back in your binos and he's gone. You're like, he's gone, yep. the deer's gone. He, he left, he must have ran off. And then you sit there and look and look and look and look and 30 minutes later you see a little ear flick or you see his head just twitch and he just, all he did is just lay down and they're notorious for disappearing. So, oh, yeah. you know, I, I would be diligent, more diligent in my glassing uh, in, in pressured units, um, that would be a tip that, that, that I would give. Yeah, um, and um, can, I, can I add something real quick on that? Yeah, for sure. So, to answer this question better, too, I've noticed, I've hunted, um, a while back I had a rifle hunt in 34A, and there was guys crawling around everywhere. But we had, we had known a certain buck was in the area and still went there anyways. And just like you said, about 10 a.m., um, most of the guys were already out of the field and gone back to their camps or back to town or whatever. Um, so you, it's almost like you, one of my tips could be not to get to, not to shy away from pressured areas as much. Um, if you, if you, you have a, a, a firm confidence in that you know what you're doing, especially if you're glassing up guys that, uh, have, are just glassing freehanded with binos, you can kind of, count those guys out as being competition for whatever buck you're whatever buck you're in there for or whatever buck you're trying to find um, just because an area's got a whole lot of pressure to like, there's like a lot of foot traffic going around doesn't necessarily mean you can't still be successful in those types of units great yeah great answer there uh, Trace uh Trace Topper, it looks like, 777. How do you go about finding a target buck and then keeping tabs on him until the hunt? That's, that's the, that's the million dollar question right there. So how, you know, how do you locate a buck you want to shoot and then how do you keep tabs on him? What do you do? So, I, you can locate him through trail camera or glassing or just randomly stumbling upon him. Um, and then keeping tabs on them, I use the trail cameras uh, as a tool like we talked about before, but it mainly comes down to to glassing and being disciplined glassing, getting out there and trying to lay actual eyes on where he is and what he's doing at the time. Um, and if, it, it's kind of hard because you have to have the time to do that. Um, especially with these older bucks, you need to, to really try to be there, like you said, during the midday glassing, too, if you don't see them in the morning, um, glassing throughout the whole day, trying to keep tabs on them. I don't know if that answers. Yeah. Think that. Great. Henry Design Build says, do you prefer hunting the higher elevations or lower elevations for coos? Hmm. Um... The typical answer is to either go extremely low or extremely high, but I feel like if you find an area that's mid-range that a lot of people don't go to, that's also a really good place to look. Um, I found monster bucks in the, in the flats. I found them mid-range. I found them up high. They can be pretty much anywhere. I'm sure you, you see that too um, in all your hunting here and in New Mexico. Yeah, for sure. Um I think I think you have to look at your own skill set too, and be yep. you know, am yep. I the type of guy that's going to be able to go for five days and not even see a deer? But maybe on that sixth day, or maybe on that fourteenth day, all of a sudden the big deer steps out. Like you have to be yep. self-aware enough to know that hey, that's I want to go see deer, and this is my one week hunt of the year, and I want it to be fun. Because a lot of times, Eric, I don't, you know, you can weigh in on that. Trying to kill big deer is, you know, it, it, it takes the right person. It, you know, like it's not fun a lot of the time. When you get done with it, you go, okay, yeah, that was awesome. But during it, yeah. the grind, it's like that was not fun. I sat for, you know, seven days and saw three does and a spike. Yeah. Like, but, yeah. you know, you know a big deer is there. You just have to stay the course. Um, thoughts? Yeah, yeah, and then tying back to his question, it seems like those higher elevation 
areas, there's uh, a general lower density of deer. Um, mid elevation, there seems to be a higher, and then low elevation, there could be you know either or. Um, and those spots where there's low density, a lot of people aren't going to be hunting because it is the 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 lack of an opportunity is kind of apparent. Um, but those same spots kind of tend to hold the biggest deer, um, and it just it does it does suck. You gotta. I think the main theme here is just being disciplined and and sticking it out. It sucks waiting that long for the right opportunity on a big deer and then not knowing if you're going to get that opportunity. Um, a lot of mental games going <laughs> into shooting yeah. big deer. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, Henry Design Build asked a question also. A uh, question for Jay and Eric. What are your three favorite units to hunt twos and why? Um, I would answer, I don't know if I'll give a three, but, uh, I really like 36C because I love glassing oak and teal. I love glassing the yep. heat. I love glassing kind of that deserty country for twos. I also enjoy it in Mexico. I love some of the ranches that are more deserty. Um, the one downside to 36C is, and I haven't been there in years, but um, you know, there's a lot of the um, illegal traffic and what have you. Um, yeah, I, I really like Unit 23 in Central Arizona because it has a wide variety of terrain. Um, those Central Arizona units have a little bit more of that manzanita and more of that kind of buck brush and just some of that, um, you know, kind of that mahogany and stuff that maybe you, you don't see like the rolling oaks and stuff like you do in Southern Arizona. But, um, and, and probably because I've I've spent quite a bit of time hunting in, in both 22 and 23. Um, but, you know, I go back to, you know, 31, the Grams, you know, the Santa Teresa's in Unit 31. I, I go back to the Galeros in, in Unit 32. Um, you know, some of the historical mountain ranges in southern Arizona I just love. Um, you know, I've never hunted 33 for twos. Um, at all. I know, Eric, you live right down there, so I'm sure you've hunted 33 quite a bit. Um, I don't know that I have one particular uh, unit that I like better than others. Yeah, and and quite honestly, you know, in the last 20 years, a lot of my experience has been hunting um, Mexico, uh, coos here in Mexico, so, you know, guys like Eric and other guys are much better, you know, to answer this question, but what are some of your favorite units and why? I'm I'm right there with you. I I don't know know if I can necessarily pick any favorites because they all each unit has their pros and cons. That they're all kind of about the same to me. Um, I do like the numbers and the thirty sixes and the the terrain in there, like the Ocotillos, like you said. Thirty four A has a lot of that same stuff. Thirty three has a lot of that same stuff, and and it has kind of like that Rocky Mountain stuff that I really like to um, to play around with, kind of like the, like what's in the Totalitas too. All that stuff is just, it's cool, to, it's cool to stock in that type of stuff. That's why I like it. But for most of these units in Arizona, they're so big, you kind of get, you get pretty much similar terrain in each unit you go um, in certain spots. So, yeah, I love all the, uh, I love the unit that has the biggest buck that I can find that year in. <laughs> <laughs> which on any given year it could be any different unit because you, you hit something. Exactly. There's a um, final question here. Um, there's some more, but we, we'll just we'll run out of time. Uh, Special Agent Blue, what's the difference between North, Central, East, and Borderland coups? Um, the one thing I would say in the Central units, like your 6A, your 21s, your 6Bs, uh, your 22, 23, it seems as though the density is a lot lower and it's a lot more poverty. Yep. Um, you go long periods of time and maybe don't see deer, and then all of a sudden you find a nice little group of deer. It seems like southern Arizona, around Tucson, you know, in the historic mountain ranges that you can pretty much find it because they at any elevation, you know, and they're not yep. quite as pockety. I, I, I know that each of the southern Arizona units have their areas of more dense and more, you know, pockets. I think that's just natural. Um, but, you know, and then you get down on the border, 
right, you know, literally right down on the border. Um, you know, with the, the thing that makes those deer unique, I think, is, you, you know, when you're out hunting, you do get a lot of different traffic with people walking around. And, and, and I think it's gotten better over the last year or two, um, maybe better than it was, you know, four, five, six years ago. Um, I don't know that the deer particularly have any differences other than I would say some of the southern Arizona deer compared to the central Arizona deer seem to be smaller, more slender slender bodies. Seems like some of the central Arizona deer, they're just a little bit bigger body, and I don't quite know why. Maybe a little bit different vegetation and feed. Um, you got anything to add to that, Eric? Yeah, I've kind of I've noticed the same. Every now and again in the southern units, you'll have a buck with a huge body, um, but overall they send they tend to be not as stout as some of those bucks you see up in central or northern Arizona. Um, yeah, I agree too with the densities um, up north. It seems like if you find you have to find little pockets of coos deer, um, but there are pretty big bucks up north. Um, in those pockets that you can find them. Um, I honestly, I haven't played around with those northern units a whole lot to really, to give the best answer, but I'm sure in the next couple of years I will, um, once I move to Phoenix. So It'll be fun I'm to up. kind of talk to you about some of your experiences over the next couple of years to see, Oh yeah, you know, being a Southern Arizona boy and, 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 and seeing how, some of the differences are, and you'll be able to give a good contrast of, or a comparison of, you know, what you're finding different and what you're finding that's very similar. So that'll be a cool conversation to have. Um, forward to chatting with you again down the road, and um, God bless you, okay? For sure, you too. Thanks for having me on. It's, it's always an honor. All right, buddy. Take care.